Man, I still, still did not remember to post this online uh, on the website. Uh, may, may that be an incentive for anyone listening online to come and be here in person so you can get an outline. Um, well, today we are, we are moving, praise God, we finished paragraph five, and we are moving into paragraph six, and I, I have a plan to get through this, this, this entire paragraph today, and um, the way that I've planned that out is I don't have any slides, I don't have pages of notes, um, what I have is an outline that's very similar to yours with just a couple extra statements next to uh, certain, certain parts of it that remind me of what's important to mention. And uh, I think if we, if we go about it this way, um, we will be able to move through this in a way that's helpful and, and maybe more manageable. Well, before we pray and before we get started, hope everybody had a very happy Thanksgiving. Good. It was a little disappointing on our end. We, um, I was looking forward, greatly looking forward to smoking my turkey this year and uh, haven't been able to do that in nine years. And that was the first time I did it. Uh, Jamie volunteered me to cook the family turkey for her mom's family gathering. I said, oh, it's no big deal. Seth can smoke it on the, on the smoker. Yeah, he'll do it. I'd never smoked a turkey in my life and had barely even known how to use my grill. I'm like, you did what? You volunteered me to do what? <laughs> but it turned out really good, and we were looking forward to doing it this year, but uh, the, uh, it was just a little too cold for a charcoal smoker. So, anyway. But uh, hope, hopefully, you know, it actually turned out better. I, all I did was go turn the, uh, the temperature up on the oven and waited a couple more hours and didn't have to do anything. It was, it was wonderful. Um, sit and drink coffee and read scripture and be be with my family. I hope your, your Thanksgiving was as enjoyable and uh, relaxing. Um, and that we have much to be thankful for. Even, even in this country, the state that it's in, we have much, 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 much to be thankful for. Uh, as Grant is so fond of reminding me, uh, as bad as we think things are in this country, they are still nowhere near as bad as they are in many parts of the world. And so... Um, we can mourn what we're losing, the good that we're losing, but still be thankful for just the immense light that the Lord has uh, shown upon uh, these lands and that we are enjoying uh, even now in the wake of it. So, so yeah, so let's pray and then we'll, we'll read this paragraph and get into it. Father, thank you for, again, for another, another Sunday of getting together with your people, Lord, as, as uh, your... Uh, faithful around the world know it is uh, in most parts of the world very costly to gather together with your people or there's not the freedom that we enjoy there's not the relative security and safety that you have granted us in in this country um, to gather and to lift up your name and worship father they do they, they gather together at risk of their lives, knowing that just because they're gathering, it may be the last time they ever get to gather here in this world with your people. But Lord, they, they count the cost and they consider it uh, the cost as being worthy of what they would gain in fellowship with your people. So I pray that we would know by, 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 sweet, uh, by your sweet grace this morning, we would know the blessing of fellowship with your people. Lord, may that encourage us to seek you all the more this week or to dedicate ourselves to you more fully. And as we're going to look at today, to be uh, far more thankful for the means that you have appointed or to bring about your purposes in our lives relating to election and salvation and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, please guide our discussion and help. May it be edifying and encouraging for all of us and glorifying to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I'm used to, I'm so used to having the slides. I even brought the clicker up here. And we don't have slides today. So, all right. Well, I have on your outline uh, a version of 
this paragraph. It's not the um, original wording of the 1689, but um, it's an updated version put out by Stan Reeves. Uh, this is the copy of the confession that we have, or we have had in the bookstore. Um, I, thought, I thought it was really helpful to follow the way he broke it down on this paragraph. So, um, Would you read along with me? Just as God, what's that? Oh, did you start reading out loud? Hey, you, that's exactly what my kids do. Yeah, 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 that's wonderful. Um, you're welcome to read it out loud with me as I, as I read. That's no, no problem at all. Um, just as God has appointed the elect to glory, so he has by the eternal and completely free purpose of his will foreordained all the means. Therefore, those who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ and effectually called to faith in Christ by his spirit working at the appropriate time. They are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith to salvation. None but the elect are redeemed by Christ or effectually called justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved. It's a rich paragraph. And uh, tons of truth we're going to look at today, but really what this is doing is helping to clarify in our minds the way that God interacts with his elect people. How does he accomplish the blessing of election in our lives? We live in time, and we're talking about God's decree that was settled in eternity. How do the two meet? How is God's decree actually accomplished in us? And the point of this paragraph is simply to say that um, though God has settled from all eternity, those who are his chosen people, those whom he will save and bring to glory in Christ, that election still has to be worked out in time. Um, so the, the first point, what we're talking about, we're talking about the foreordained means that God uses to bring his chosen people to the end of glory that he's determined for them. Boy, I get complicated in my sentences, don't I? When we're talking about the means, the foreordained means, we're talking about those things that God has appointed that will ensure that his people come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and unto redemption in his name. When we're talking about means, what we're talking about are the instruments that God uses to accomplish his ends in our lives, to accomplish his purpose. All right, so that first sentence, it says that God has not only appointed the elect unto glory, but he has appointed all the means that will bring them unto glory. Um, this kind of gets at the relationship between God's eternal decree and the outworking of that decree in time and its relation to human responsibility. Um, God has settled what will take place from all eternity, and he has decreed that what he wants to happen will unfold by the use of means. These are the secondary causes that we were talking about in paragraph one, right? This, this is how the will of the creature is not impeded by what God has determined to bring to pass. This is, this is why it matters what we do. And it matters what we don't do. Though it's all settled by the decree of God, he has decreed that the means are the way in which his will will be accomplished. So what are these means? Uh, this paragraph says that he's foreordained the means to bring the elect unto their foreordained glory. What are those means that he uses uh, to bring us to that end? Um, the first one that you see, well, the first statement that you see there is really framing in our minds how to think about those who are being elected, those who are being brought to this end. It says, therefore, in the second sentence, those who are elected, being fallen in Adam, being fallen in Adam, um, and then it goes on, are redeemed by Christ. Now, just... Before we get into the means that are identified, you need to keep in mind that all of these are being appointed for the salvation of the elect in consideration of their fallenness. Right? That's what the confession is saying. 
that when God determined that he would deliver and save and redeem a people for his own eternal uh, glory and that he identified who those specific people would be, it was in consideration of them already being fallen in Adam. Right? And, and if you remember that discussion on double predestination and equal ultimacy, and those words we were throwing around, that God's deal, this is simply saying that God's dealings with the elect are not going to be the same as God's dealings with the non-elect. He didn't create the non-elect to be sinners. He gave them over to what they wanted to be. They wanted to be sinners. Now, that was established by his decree, but it was not... He did not design the actual sins that they would commit. Well, here, for, for those who are fallen in Adam, he is taking out of that fallen lump in Adam a, a certain group of people who are specifically identified, and he is choosing that by certain appointed means, he is going to bring those whom he's chosen who are fallen in Adam unto redemption in Christ Jesus. So the way that these means work... Uh, they are, well, not the way that they work. It's just important to remember that the people who are in view here are, uh, when God is speaking of redeeming them, he is redeeming them out of something, which is their fallenness in Adam. Now, what are the means that God has appointed to bring us out of our fallenness in Adam and unto his glory? That's what we want to look at now. The first one mentioned, what would you say the first means mentioned is in this paragraph? Where? The death of Jesus. The death of Jesus? Well, that's, the that's, of Jesus. all that's definitely implied. But think of it, those are like specific ideas that are categorized underneath a general heading in this, in this second sentence. What is that first means that God has appointed whereby he will bring his elect to salvation? Justification. I hear justification. I heard awakening. Awakening. Someone else said something else. Someone said something else. What was it? Redemption. That's, that's the first means that God has appointed. Redemption by Christ. If you remember, uh, if you were wondering why, either last week or the week before, I was saying that we are not chosen um, to be saved because of Christ, but rather we are chosen to be saved in Christ. Here's the distinction. Christ was appointed to be the means of our salvation, but the choice to save us came first, right? And so the question here is, or no, not the question, what this is getting at is that those who are chosen, those who are elected by God out of this fallen human race in Adam, they were not going to be brought to glory. They were not going to be redeemed for the glory of God's name apart from the accomplished redemption in Christ Jesus. That it could not happen any other way according to God's decree. That's what we're getting at here. Uh, somebody open up to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. And um, Bill, would you, actually, Bill, would you mind reading that? Bill Butler? Yeah. Yeah, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses uh, 9 and 10, I believe. I think I have that. Yep. Just read that clearly for me. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Amen. So what do we have in view here? God has not destined us for wrath. What's that talking about? Well, wrath is talking about eternal damnation, but God has not destined us for that. That's talking about election. That God has decreed that he has not appointed us to this end, right? Now, in order to bring us, in order to accomplish that, where God decides these certain people are not going to experience my wrath, in order to accomplish that end, it says here that he has dest not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, this is really important to keep in. I don't know how many of you. Okay, hang on. I just jumbled up some sentences there. This is important to keep in mind. I don't know how many of you, when, if or when you were awakened to the doctrines of grace, if you got really excited by that and adopted any kind of uh, understanding of election or justification as being eternal justification, uh, that, that the elect have always been saved. And anyone, anyone ever fall into that? Wow, I'm the only one. Okay. So this actually is an error uh, that, that says that because these certain people were chosen to be saved, in effect, they always have been saved. So like, there's, no, there's no real need for the conversion element of it because they're simply chosen to be saved and they're always going to be saved. Right? There's nothing they can do about it. Now, this kind of teaching, though, corrects that misunderstanding. That's not true. God has decreed that they will be saved. He's not destined them for wrath, but to obtain salvation in Christ. That's his will. That's his purpose. But that purpose is not going to be accomplished apart from the finished work of Jesus Christ being accomplished on their behalf. Right? So he's, he's destined us for salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. These are things that Jesus accomplished in time. God has determined that we would be saved outside of time, but the means by which that salvation would be accomplished was something that the Son of God was going to accomplish in time, was based upon something that the Son of God would accomplish for us in time. Um, I, just as another example, illustration, you can throw out Galatians 3.13. If you want to flip over there. Galatians 3.13, it says, For Christ, no, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, that that is God's intention for us, right? According to 1 Thessalonians 5.9, that we are not destined for wrath, which is the curse of the law, but unto salvation. We are destined to be redeemed for salvation. But Christ has accomplished that redemption for us. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. The curse of the law was not going to be handled in any other way. It was going to be done away with in any other way. God had determined that this is the means that he would glorify his name in redeeming sinners by sending the Son of God to redeem them from the curse by becoming a curse for them. Go ahead, Bill. Words like becoming and destined are... They mean time. I mean, that's what they mean. Destiny is something that will happen. Becoming is something that happens. So it's built into those verses, the language, the concept of time not always being. Hang on. Clarify what you mean by that. I'm not sure that I... You said that error was that these people were always saved, that, that you know, that those destined were always saved. No, if you're destined, it's something that's going to happen. And, and Jesus, you know, becoming the curse, that's something he became, uh, implies yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. I think I just had written here, the Father's decree is to redeem us, but that redemption was accomplished by means of Christ actually becoming our curse. It wasn't going to happen any other way. So the first means that the confession talks about is the means of being redeemed in or by, by Christ. Now, I, man, that's what I meant to do. I meant to bring Flavel's writing about the eternal agreement between the Father and Son, and read that. But uh, we don't have it, so I'm not going uh, to. Just as a point of clarification, uh, it says, whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. But then it talks about in the rapture, those that are alive are going to be raised first, and then those that are asleep will be raised. Can, uh, can you explain that or clarify that? I guess I'm... I, I can, real quick, I can try to do that quickly. 
try to do it quickly. Um, well, it says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that at the second coming, when Christ comes with the trumpet blast, the cry of the archangel, right? this, this isn't a secret coming of the Lord. This is a, an open, loud, acknowledged, lightning striking from the east to the west type coming of, of the Lord, right? So... Verse 16, 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, whose souls have departed and gone home, which is where Christ is. They have gone to be with Christ. When Christ returns, they will be the first ones raised. They will be raised with the Lord. If they're already with Christ, to because be absent they're not, from the body is to be present. Not, because the Lord. They're, because they're not bodily raised. So is, is there, are there old bodies going to be raised then at the yes. rapture, but we get new bodies when we're with Christ, right? So, there, so it is your body glorified. So when Christ comes, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's your fallen body perfected by the work of Christ, brought to complete conformity to the body of his glory. That's what Philippians 3.21 says, I think. Um, raised, incorruptible. raised incorruptible, right? The mm -hmm. perishable putting on the imperishable. Um, what's that? Full copy of Jesus. Full copy, you could say full uh, conformity to Jesus Christ, right? That's where we reach the fullness of redemption. So, so the is, is soul, at the resurrection of the body. When we die, our soul goes to be with Christ, who we really are. Yeah. But our body stay, our old body stays behind. So when Christ comes. For the rapture, do our souls go back into our old body and that's recreated and glorified? Is yeah, the body is glorified then, and then those who belong to Christ who have not fallen asleep yet are caught up raised. to be with them in the air. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when the saints who are alive at the second coming of Christ, at that moment when Christ has this public descent from glory, and the dead in Christ are raised and, and glorified with him at that moment. And I don't think that there's like that happens and then like a period of time passes and then this happens, you know, the saints that are alive are raised. I think it's simply the Lord cracking open the heavens and stepping down, raising up his people who have departed and gone to be with him in glory. And at that time, calling all those who are alive at that moment who belong to him, calling them up so that there's this great assembling of the people of Christ that has spanned the centuries, right? There's this great assembling together of them in time. Um, just like as a side note, uh, this is kind of a side note, but just that is what our gatherings on Sunday mornings are supposed to be a picture of. That gathering together of the people of Christ before him to worship him and live with him. That's what, that's what Sunday mornings are supposed to be a, a picture of what will be fulfilled on that day when Christ, when Christ comes. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I, I don't know, um, did I answer that? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so that, that will be, uh, that is the determined end that God has decreed for us, Mike. And until that day comes, the, the, the full purposes of God and bringing us into conformity with his beloved son and unto eternal glory will not yet be realized. And so even though that's the decreed end, it still is going to play out according to means and, and end time. Yeah. So the first one it mentions is being redeemed by Christ. And the, uh, the second one um, it, that the confession mentions is effectual calling. Therefore, you see in that second sentence, therefore those who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ and effectually called to faith in Christ by his spirit. It says working at the appropriate time. Now, uh, John Murray, have you read John Murray's Redemption, Accomplished, and Applied? Yeah, so, so here we are. I know you probably have. Yes, no, no, yes, no? 
Um, anyone else? Redemption accomplished and applied. I know Levita has tried to slug through that. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie tried. Um, Eric Marshall tried. Yeah, yeah. Before they finally asked me to stop leading that study. <laughs> it's a. It is a great book. It's one of my favorite books outside of the scriptures. Um, but that book is broken into two sections. It's written by a guy named John Murray, um, and it is. It's broken into the section that is dealing with redemption being accomplished by Christ and then redemption being applied to the elect by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so this is, this is what this paragraph is really, really holding up before us and saying that these, these two things are means that God has determined to bring his elect unto the decreed determined salvation. One is the accomplished redemption in Christ, but then secondly, that happened in time. But then secondly, there's the effectual calling to faith in Christ by his spirit. So, oh man, this is why I type things out so that I, I thought this would be helpful today not to do that. But uh, so many, so many thoughts running through my mind. Well, how do you understand what it means when we're talking about effectual calling? What does that mean? Irresistible. Irresistible. Irresistible calling. When, when God calls someone to be saved, he, he's not going to. That's, that is not going to fail. It, um, if he says you're going to be saved, you're going to be When he calls someone to be saved, that call is not going to fail. Yeah. yeah. It will be thwarted by him. Miss Amy. Yeah, the action of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, um, irresistible action. That all of that is right. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about effectual, it, we're talking about something that brings about an effect, right? It, there's something that's it's powerful. It's actually accomplishing something. Now, in Scripture, we have from the Lord, we have two different kinds of callings for people to come to salvation. We have what is called a general call to salvation, and then we have what this identifies as an effectual call. The general call to salvation would be seen in passages like Isaiah 45, 22, where the Lord stands before all the earth, as it were, and and proclaims over the entire world, turn to me and be saved, for I am God and there is no other. Right? And, then, and then he gives the reason why, the, the urgency behind that call. For to me, the word has gone forth, it will not return void, that, that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. Right? So God is warning the entire world, saying, you are going to bow the knee to me one day. And your tongue is going to swear allegiance to me as the God of all the earth one day. So why not come now? Why not do that now before that day of judgment comes? Why not bow, as one preacher puts it, why not bow willingly now rather than bowing because your kneecaps are shattered then, right? And that that is the general call, you know, that many are called but few are chosen. That's that that broad calling that goes out into all the world, that John 3.16 calling. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And then John goes on to define who the world is. The world consists, the world that those verses is talking about consists of two groups of people, those who believe and those who do not. So I don't don't care what your exegesis is of that. You must see that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a declaration of the love of God to every single human being in this world, elect or not. So I love, uh, and uh, Ian Murray has a book uh, called, uh, uh, I think it's Old Evangelicalism. And in that there's a chapter uh, that's titled The Cross, The Pulpit of God's Love. And he's just tracing back through reformed, historic, solid men who saw the the cross as the pulpit by which God declared his love for the entire world. Something that needs to be recovered, uh, especially among reformed circles in our day. 
But was there a comment? Yeah, Bill? So that, there's, that, there's that general calling that we find in Scripture. That is not what we're talking about when we're talking about the effectual calling. And we'll get to that in a second. Go ahead, brother. Well, I, I was going to say, uh, so God makes, so the Scripture makes that general calling, and the, 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 the uh, preacher, in his role as prophet, also uses the Scripture. He participates in that. But the effectual calling can only be done by God. Yes, and I would, <clears throat> I would say also, though, that the effectual calling is still heralded through yes. the means of a preacher. Yes. Right? Um, this is Romans 10. How will they believe unless they hear? How will they hear unless there's someone sent to preach to them? Yeah, true. Right? And um, I, I think this is going to get to what, what the last point is really bringing out, which is that the means of God, just let's use this as an illustration, as an example. The general calling of God goes out to the world by the same means that the effectual calling comes upon the elect. So the same, the same word of God, the same preaching of the word of God goes out into the world as a general call to everyone. But by the Holy Spirit, that general calling is made effectual so that it actually brings the object that's being called to the point to which it's being called, right? So like there's this, there's this owning of the Holy Spirit of these means that brings God's chosen people to his chosen and determined end for them. Uh, Mike. So no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws him? Yes. Uh, we're controlled by the sinful nature until we're born again, and we're controlled by the Spirit of God. The, the Word of God is a power unto salvation. So how does that all work together with the Spirit and the Word or preaching? It's, it's so important to preach the Word, which is a power unto salvation, which a lot of preachers aren't doing. So. It's the Word, it's the Spirit, it's God the Father drawing. How does that gel together and work together? Um, what, let me keep going right. and then see if any clarity is given, okay? okay. It's a great question. And, uh, and there's, again, brother, this is another issue where uh, we have to say, I don't know exactly, um, but I know what it looks like when the Lord effectually calls someone through the preaching of the word and when he doesn't, and, and we'll, we'll get an example of that in a minute. Go ahead, brother. I understand. The, it's the same call, <clears throat> but it's just made effectual by the yeah, Holy Spirit. Yeah, I mean, so th theologically, they are divided into two different two different treatments, where you're treating a general call that goes out broadly, the effectual call that is specifically applied. But yes, like in its essence, we're talking about the one calling of God for sinners right. to come to salvation. That makes yeah. sense, because what I was thinking yeah. otherwise is, would the general call be an ineffectual call? You know, if it doesn't do anything. So what we're talking, it's not ineffectual, and we're gonna look at that in a second. It actually is accomplishing something in those who are not elect, it's, it's hardening them. Um, but but the, uh, the effectual part that we're talking about is that it's, it's made to work unto the end for which God has established it. So the calling is effectual unto salvation for the elect. It, it accomplishes that end. It's not ineffectual for those who are not elect, but when we're talking about being redeemed in Christ and that redemption in Christ being applied to us, that's, that's what we mean when we're talking about the effectual yeah, calling. Ineffectual in the sense of it's, it's, not, it's not calling them to follow the call. I mean, it's not being effective to get them to do what the call is calling them to. It's, it's actually creating a change right. in them and uniting them. Really, what we're talking about is in that calling, there's this... There's this regeneration that's taking place. You're being born again. You're, you're, you're through the gift of faith 
and repentance. You are turning from the world and turning unto Christ, and you're being united to him and, and adopted as a son. So, like, all of this is involved in that effectual calling. It's almost like God speaking to uh, a flower seed and causing that flower to grow and blossom in a moment, right? That's, that's, that's what happens in, in the effectual calling in the life of a sinner. When the gospel comes with that same kind of the creative power, it, it actually causes change in them. It produces life in them and, and a principle of godliness. Yeah. So, so Barna says that 80% of evangelical Christians are not born again. Is there an advantage or what advantage is there for an unregenerate person that's not going to come to Christ to be under involved in a church or under the, under the teaching and so forth? What advantage is there? Well, or what, yeah, does it do them any good or doesn't it? Well, it depends on what perspective you have. Um, if you're viewing it from God's perspective, it is good because they're hearing the truth about who God is and they're hearing the reality of their fallen condition. And they are hearing, if the word of God is being preached, they're hearing the remedy to their fallenness and the judgment that they will face from this holy God. They're hearing about Christ. And, and in that, you know, this is the Acts 17.31, right? Uh, the Father bearing witness to all that he's going to judge the world in righteousness, testifying to that by raising through one man uh, testifying to that by raising him from the dead. There is that good that is being done by God being honored and God being glorified before their eyes. Is it accomplishing anything good in that person's life? Um, only in the sense that God's righteousness will be vindicated through them in their judgment. They're held more accountable. <coughs> Now, as far as their subjective experience, no, it's, it's not leading to any. Yeah, there, yes, go ahead. Yeah, there, there is. Yeah. Yeah, there is that. There is that curbing of ungodliness that can happen as well. Yeah. Knowing godly wisdom can practically help live life in a good way, yeah, I would say. But Yeah, I was, I was saying that. Um, knowing you know, the Bible still contains godly wisdom and you know, say you know, Christian worldview and everything, and so if people have that, that can, I guess, from a carnal perspective, still help them live life well. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. A, not necessarily scientific. But. Yeah, and really, that's common grace, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the benefit of common grace. Um, yeah, the country is a good example of that. Our country. Our country is a good example of that. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Because America has not been a redeemed nation, but it has definitely partaken in the blessings that belong to the redeemed on a national scale that, that very few countries in the world have ever experienced. So. Yeah, it's, I'd say it's bad for the church. It might, it might be good for the country, but it's bad for the church to have churches full of unrepentant sinners. Is, is tearing the church down. Yeah, uh, definitely, it definitely does not help. Yeah. yeah, so effectual calling, where were we on that? Um, general calling, I think we've kind of we've hammered out the difference between the general calling and the effectual calling. The effectual calling is that calling of God to salvation being applied to a person's life by the Holy Spirit that actually causes that person to respond to the call, right? To like move out of sin, move away from ungodliness and move towards the Lord. Um, this, the confession here says, you know, how does this effectual calling happen? This means of actually in time, applying the redeeming work of Christ to this sinner to bring them unto glory, as one means of bringing them unto glory. How does that happen? Well, it happens by the Holy Spirit. It happens by the Holy Spirit taking the truth of Christ and uniting that sinner to the truth of Christ in such a way that that sinner is made new and is never the same again. I mean, this is uh, one of my favorite uh, passages on this. i got a lot of favorite passages, but one of my favorite passages on this, 
ones I quote very often, is Galatians 5, uh, verses um, 24 and 25. It says, um, and, and just by the way, I, I was reading through the whole book of Galatians yesterday and uh, was, was amazed at how much the book of Galatians talks about the need for the Holy Spirit. Very interesting. Um, when, when, when Paul is writing to a group of people who are being distracted from Christ, his answer is to highlight their need for the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, we can't go into all my thoughts on that, but I, just, I found that really amazing. So, verse 18, uh, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, um, then you have what it means to walk according to the flesh, kind of laid out there in verses 19 through 21. Then you have what it looks like to be led by the Spirit in verse 22 and 23, that you have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now he gets to verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What, is, what are those passions and desires that Paul has in mind when he wrote that verse? Yeah, he's, ta he's talking about verses 19 through 21. Right? So when we're talking about the, the passions of, and desires of the flesh being crucified in Christ when a person is born again, we're talking about those desires to live in immorality, those desires to be sensual, those desires... Uh, towards strife and sorcery and idolatry and disputes and factions and drunkenness and carousing, all of those things, when you are united to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're made alive in him, you are crucified with him to the desires and the passions to walk in those ways. So therefore, we can say if someone continues to live a life of idolatry, continues to live a life of immorality, continues to walk in drunkenness, that person has not yet been united to Christ. Because the Spirit has not taken the redeeming work of Christ and applied it to that person in such a way that that person is set free. The effect of Christ's redemption is not being realized in that person's life, which means that the Spirit of God is not applying the effect of Christ's redemption to him or her. But... I like in your outline notes at the appropriate time. Yes, we're going to get there in just a second. Now... But now those who belong to Christ Jesus, they have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. There has been this, this real and utter break with this kind of sensual and ungodly desire and behavior. Doesn't mean that they're going to live perfect lives from now on, but it does mean that they have been ultimately severed from the kind of life that can thrive in that environment. Right? They don't want to live in that way. And whenever they do stumble into those areas, they're sickened by it. They, they mourn. This is Ezekiel 36 language. They, they see the ways that they've sinned against the Lord and they loathe themselves for their sins. That that's what happens in a believer's life. It's not about being perfect, but it is about having a real change wrought by the Holy Spirit in our hearts so that we no longer enjoy walking in ungodliness because now our passions and our desires have been renewed to be godly. Hold on just a second, brother. Then... So you have that union with Christ, that re regeneration taking place in Christ. And then look how, he, look how he says it in verse 25. If then, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Now, right there, Paul is attributing all of this renewal work and this renewal work on one end, but dying to sin on the other end. In Christ, he is, he is attributing all of that to being made alive by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I say it's the Holy Spirit that takes the work of Christ and unites us to that work in such a way that it actually produces real change in our lives. Right? So that the death Christ died to sin causes us to die to sin, practically. The, 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 the life of righteousness that he lived causes us to want to live and, and have an ability to live after righteousness like him, mirroring him, imitating him. This is 1 John 2, right? We know that we've come to know him if we walk in the way that he walked, if we keep his commandments. 
Anyway, I'm simply pointing out that this redeeming work of Christ in, in actually touching the life of a sinner and, and, and the sinner being united to Christ and being made a partaker in that redeeming work, all of that is accomplished by the Holy Spirit in his or her life. Now that leads to the responsibility, if we've been made alive in Christ, we also have the responsibility to continue. Uh, if we've been made alive in the Spirit, we have the responsibility to keep walking in the Spirit, right? That's sanctification. But it says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Seems to imply that we have a responsibility to crucify the flesh. The question is, how do we do that, and what does that mean? Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of what I was just just walking through, that what it means to have the passions and desires of the flesh crucified. It means that, that, that in, a, in a real, tangible sense, those things have been put to death in your life because you've been united to Christ. And in union with Christ, you're united not only to his resurrection life, but you're also united to his death. He died to sin once for all that he might put it away by the sacrifice of himself, Hebrews 9. When we are united to Christ, there is that real separation that is brought about in us, which is the effect of Christ dying for sin. There is that real separation from sin that is worked into us by the Holy Spirit, uniting us to the Lord Jesus. Uh, Paul describes it in, at the end of the chapter this way, or at the end of chapter 6. He says, But may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What's that? What That's uh, Galatians 6.14. And so there, four, he goes on to say, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but what really matters, he gets at here in verse 15, what really matters is being made a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And um, yeah, what he's saying there is that the true people of God are those who have been united to Christ by the Holy Spirit in such a way that they are dead to the world now, and they are now made alive unto the Lord. Paul talks about it in, in Romans, where he says, the very things I want to do, I don't, and the things that I don't want to do, I do, but it's no longer I who does it, but sin so living in me. And so there's a war going on. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? But yeah. I, I guess the question that I have, do we have the power in ourselves to, when the flesh attacks us, even though it's not us anymore, uh, do we really have the power to put it to death? In Romans, it talks about implore the Holy Spirit to put it to death. Yeah. And so I think we have our, our obligation is to go to the Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I see this sin in my life. Oh, wretched man I am, rescue me from it, put it to death. Yeah. And immediately he does, I think. And then it's 10 minutes later, that flesh comes back again and is warring. It's a constant battle till we die or Christ returns. And it's going absolutely, on all the time. absolutely. But, does but the, the Holy Spirit put it to death, or does He empower us so that we can overcome it? So, to death? yeah, so it yeah, is, it is, it, us. it is by the Spirit that we put to death the deeds of the body. Yeah, there's, a, there's a both and, not an either or. Uh, the, if we live by the Spirit, we are to walk by the Spirit. We have a responsibility in sanctification to work out our sanctification, our salvation with, with fear and trembling because it is God that works in us both to do and the will of His good pleasure. Right? Philippians 2, 12 and 13. I think we also have to remember that Paul was truthful, that He doesn't tempt us, but when we're tempted, that He provides a way out for us. Amen. So that's the part that we have to do. It is a struggle, it is a battle, because we are working against this flesh and spirit or at war against one yeah. another. Yeah. But where you begin to crucify, it, it's, it's that, uh, I guess the only word I can think of is a progressive. As you um, look for that way out, as you deny yourself, as you turn away, put off this and put on yeah. you know, godly uh, behavior and godly choices, it gets, it seems, um, and maybe not true for all, but it would become an easier exercise to do that over yeah. time. Yeah. And that's where the maturity of, of walking in faith as we get older, where when we're younger in the faith and maybe we're, we're more rash or more prone to do things a certain way, as we get older, 
as we've walked through those times where we've had to make those choices, um, putting off the old and putting on the new, um, looking for that way out. God does provide those ways out, not always in the way that we want, yeah. you know, but those ways are there. Yeah, I would, I would, um, oh, oh man, what was I about to say? That's very good. It is progressive. It's progressive sanctification. I think the best way to understand this is that I, I don't know of anywhere in Scripture where we are said to be crucifying presently and continually the flesh. We are called to put it to death, yes, but when Paul talks about being crucified with Christ, it's a past tense thing. There's a definitive union with Christ that's taken place. Now, that union with his death is progressively being worked out in our lives, right? It's, it's being extended to other areas of our lives, and that's where the empowering of the Holy Spirit comes, and we actually work out sanctification, like what Amy was just talking about, or what Mike was talking about in Romans 7. But there is that definitive break that must be the foundation behind all of that before we, before we will be enabled to do it. Uh, Mike, in Romans 7, I think you see that where Paul says, when he, he's talking about this, this confliction between what he desires to do and what he actually does. Right? That the desire is in him to do what is right. And the desire is in him not to do what is wrong. And yet he finds in himself an inability to do all that he desires to do. And that's, that's not in conflict with what we're talking about in Galatians 5. It's just saying there is that definitive break and then that break still has to be worked out to the rest of life. How long was Paul born again when he wrote that chapter in Romans? Like, was he like 10 years walking with the Lord we'll, or three years or? We'll come back to that. Um, we're out of time and I'm sorry. I no, I, I don't exactly know offhand. Um, I think that if I'm not mistaken, you know, this is when Paul is aiming to go to Spain <laughs> via Rome and he hasn't, doesn't seem he's been to Rome yet. We're probably looking somewhere in the 50s, maybe, maybe 60, so, something like that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll confirm that and get back to you. Yeah, yeah I'll confirm it. Yeah, he's towards the end of his ministry. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how long his ministry was. Well, uh, yeah, tradition, he was put to death in 68. Yeah, so... Probably 2025. That triggered in my mind what I was going to say earlier, and we need to close. We need to be done. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, I think as we get older, we understand it becomes easier to know how to put things to death. But the things that we are called to put to death as we get older get harder and harder to put to death. Does that, does that make sense? Because there are deeper issues that you have to deal with than, than what you were dealing with in the beginning. As you get close, as you work towards perfection, you start understanding what perfection is. And how imperfect yeah. you really are. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You never Let's, an espresso, so you don't even know you're dirty. I have the answer to the question. Hang on. Talk, talk to her and just, you can talk to her after class, I promise, yeah. I won't, I won't hinder you from doing that. <laughs> 48, around, yeah, around 48. Thanks, okay. thanks, Corbin. Okay. Father, thank you for this time. And um, Lord, as weak and imperfect as we are, we are, we are trying to honor you and, and see the truth of your word. We thank you for those who have gone before us, Lord, who have kind of mapped out a way theologically to, to help us understand truth and to help us understand the message of, of your word. And uh, I pray we would hear them, that we wouldn't hear them uncritically, but that uh, your, your word would be the ultimate test and standard by which we compare everything, even what we're talking about in this confession. Lord, I pray you would bless us as we gather with your people in this next hour, hour and a half. Lord, let your spirit be among us. Let Christ's name be lifted high, and may we unite together 
and lifting up a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you. Father, we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.